In 1980, Joe Rohde was hired by Disney during the development of Epcot as a model designer and scenic painter for the Mexico Pavilion. He would work on multiple projects over the years until he would create one of his own, the Adventurers Club, which opened in 1989 within the Pleasure Island Entertainment District, a highly themed and immersive experience that fans would adore. It would be this highly detailed experience that would be a core factor in the designer's next project, Animal Kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom of animals. First came the Magic Kingdom, then Epcot, then Disney MGM Studios, and now... <laughs> Introducing the most adventurous Walt Disney World theme park ever. Disney's Animal Kingdom, the imagination of Disney, gone wild. Walt Disney once said that some of the most fascinating people he had ever met were animals, and animals and Walt Disney would go hand in hand right back to the start of his career. From Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, the forest creatures in Snow White, and to his first audio animatronics in the Enchanted Tiki Room. One thing has always led to another here, and Bambi was no exception. The wildlife scenes in this research yielded an unexpected dividend. An idea for a new motion picture series we called The True Life Adventure. The True Life Adventures, though, would be the series that gave audiences an up-close view of animals. 14 episodes were created, with 8 of them winning Oscars during the series run in the 50s. They would also be one of the earliest production experiences for Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew. Walt's original vision really was a whole wonderland of possibilities for film that, that had not really been explored before. Many years later, Roy would be deeply involved in the creation of a new animal-based theme park. Of course, to stock Adventureland with live animals was neither safe nor practical. So on paper, we began to sketch and design replicas that would be made of plastic and steel, but when in action, would be as lifelike as their real counterparts. In the early 1950s, when Walt was planning Disneyland, he had the idea that would bring animals and humans together. A boat ride where animals were stationed along the banks of the river. When the idea proved to be too difficult, audio animatronic figures took the place of live animals on the Jungle Cruise. It would be over 40 years later that the idea would actually come to life. The three important things are story, story, and story. And I think that's where the, the real success came from. That didn't mean that animals were not on the mind of the Disney company when making the move to Florida though. More than one quarter of the huge Florida property was set aside as a permanent wildlife preservation area. Walt personally initiated the 7,500 acre area when buying the land to house Walt Disney World. Disney also created programs for recycling, composting, and water conservation, firmly placing environmentality into the company's culture. A few years after Walt Disney World opened in 1971, guests could visit an island in the center of Bay Lake, an 11.5 acre zoological park featuring 200 species of wildlife. A 2,700 square foot animal hospital even lived on the island, with it being an accredited member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The island was renamed Discovery Island and was a sample of much bigger things to come. Animal Kingdom is coming on stream, will open when? Next spring, May 6th. Cost what, a billion dollars? Cost a lot. A lot of money. A lot of money. Okay. In late 1989, when the company was working on their first European park, and after the opening success of Disney's MGM Studios, CEO Michael Eisner wanted a key part of the 1990s, or as he dubbed it, the Disney decade, to be a fourth theme park. It is going to be the biggest and most ambitious theme park that we have ever built. They would tap into the company's rich history of animals and conservation to find that idea. Michael Eisner said the new part would be a traditional zoo as the motion picture was to the stage play, a leap forward that keeps the concept of combining education and entertainment. It is widely known that the original push to create such a park would come from Roy E. Disney. Other than an animal park, the other option considered was a music themed park. When Joe Rohde was asked where the push came from an animal park, he credited it to Eisner. 
with messages being sent asking to do something with animals as far back as 1988. Marty Sklar got the word out to the company's designers looking for input on an animal themed project. It would be a small team led by Joe Rohde who would be tasked with bringing the vision to life. The concerns were that if you did something with animals, you would be in competition with zoos, and that there are so many zoos uh, all around the country that it would be very difficult to differentiate yourself, to get people to understand that this was something that you wanted to fly down to Florida to see. Eisner didn't want just another ride and show theme park. He wanted to build something that would educate and inspire guests, featuring Earth's creatures, past, present, and mythological. Joe Rohde would create a concept aerial overview for his vision of the park in 1991, featuring a snow peak mountain, villages, and an open savanna. The entranceway was envisioned as a replica of Noah's Ark. As more and more artwork was completed, Eisner and company president Frank Wells began to have second thoughts about the project. Concerned whether a theme park based on animals would generate enough profit and excitement among guests. During a meeting of the executives, Joe Rohde brought in a real Bengal tiger. He began by telling them that he knew there was concern over whether animals are exciting enough, right after the 400 pound tiger was led into the room by a keeper. The CEO and president never doubted that animals would have an impact again, and went full speed ahead on the brand new animal theme park. Frank Wells actually became one of the park's biggest supporters. Uh, I was told that you were the only guy in house that wanted to go ahead, that a lot of your colleagues said don't do this. I mean, it's going to compete with the other stuff we have down there. We don't need it. I don't think that's true. The Disney decade was in full swing with Euro Disneyland well underway and with plans to expand the US park's footprints. Resorts and the addition of the cruise line meant that Animal Project was the dark horse. Not many Imagineers believed it would even happen or that it was just a zoo and many were not even interested in working on the project. Hence why the team was led by a junior designer. For Joe Rohde though, it was the theme aspect of the park that would be the key factor to making this park different to anything seen before. On the outskirts of the Disney Resort, a 500 acre section of land was chosen and the small team of Imagineers began planning. A few different areas for the park were considered, including the site where Celebration now sits. The reason the current site was chosen was for a few different reasons. One, it was a blank canvas and could be anything, and two, it faced the correct way. When you enter the park, the sun is behind you, illuminating the park and the tree of life. Ideas of what could be bounced back and forward between the team and countless hours were spent on the road thousands of miles away, researching. The key to creating this heavenly themed story based animal park was research. While Joe had visited many of the places he would later feature, he insisted his team also got to see such things firsthand. It took them to all corners of the globe, and most experiences and items you see in the park today come from real-life experiences of those designing the park on these trips. The research trip took years and cost a lot of money. They traveled more than 500,000 miles where they took photos, made sketches, collected items, and even took notes on the way the land was, all for the sake of creating the most authentic theme park ever designed. Not everything went to plan though. A year after planning began, the project was put on hold with the focus switch to getting Euro Disneyland open on time. The, the first question is a short one. Why? Uh, we always thought the idea of doing something with animals, fantasy animals, real animals, prehistoric animals would be appropriate for our company and why not? One decision that was needed was what would be the park's icon, the Cinderella Castle or Spaceship Earth of Animal Kingdom. Something that would show everything the park stood for. The first idea for the icon was a large rotating carousel with flying creatures to whirl around on. Then it was designed to be a 50 foot tall bayon tree for children to climb on, but something more grand was required. The final design was a 145 foot tall tree of life that would display how all of the animals in the world were intertwined and relied on each other. Carved into the tree trunk are 325 animals, which were put piece by piece onto the frame. Sculpting the animals took 12 months. The Tree of Life is actually a technological marvel, and while first was going to sit on a large dome, it was then inspired by how oil rigs were built. It was originally planned to have a restaurant in the bottom before the Tough To Be A Bug show took its place. The body of the tree was formed of all the rich wealth of animals uh, across the face of uh, the earth and the history of the earth. There's dinosaurs and trilobites as well as gorillas and giraffes and herds of wildebeest on the tree. 
With the help of some of the greatest animal experts, Disney learned a lot about animals. From things such as what plants they could place near which to not be toxic, to how to keep them happy and feed them. Most of the food for the animals within the park will be grown for them at Walt Disney World. Seeds and plants were brought in from all over the world to grow food. The landscape was going to be the main aspect of the park, and even the smallest detail had to be considered such as pest control, which they could not use pellet form so animals would not mistake them for seeds. The well-being of more than 1,000 animals would be the top priority. Leading the animal care would be Rick Barongi, who came to the project with a large background in conservation and animal care. He brought in an experienced team from the country's best zoos as the director of animal project development. Joe Rohde and Marty Sklar wanted to establish a program of care before the park had opened, not after. They would acquire more than 1,000 animals for the new theme park. Rick created a list of animals that would fit within the park and that the park could house safely. To acquire a family of gorillas, they worked out a deal with the Lincoln Park Zoo to create a gorilla conservation fund and sponsor a project. Animal Kingdom also took so many of the top zookeepers from around the world, it even caused a panic within the industry. Yeah, take a good look. Yes, Safari Regis. I'm here at the Animal Kingdom Park. I can't wait. I got my own private tour of this park because when you're a star, that's what you get. Anyway, here's the director of animal programs, Rick Barangi. Nice to see you, Rick. How you doing? Hi, Regis. Nice yeah, to meet you. Congratulations on this place. Yeah, it's great. Before opening, guests were surveyed with the option of several potential names. Disney's Animal Kingdom, Wild World, Animal Adventure, Wild Territorium, The Animal Expedition at Disney, or Animal Encounter. The questionnaire also asked how guests would spend their vacation and if they would consider cancelling a trip to Busch Gardens if Disney opened an animal park. Originally the park was announced to be called Wild Animal Kingdom, but issues with the copyright being owned by Mutuals of Omaha who used the name Wild Kingdom in a TV nature show they sponsored changed it to Animal Kingdom. The park was officially announced in 1995 and expected to cost $700 to $800 million. By July 1996, construction was underway on the animal holding facilities along with the installation of trees and landscaping, with most of the park's animals being acquired in the fall of 1997. Before moving to the park, they were held at a rented holding facility in North Florida. Welcome to the kingdom of animals, real, ancient, and imagined. A kingdom ruled by lions, dinosaurs, and dragons. A kingdom of balance, harmony, and survival. A kingdom we enter to share in the wonder, gaze at the beauty, thrill at the drama, and learn. As is tradition for the opening of a Disney park, on April 21st, 1998, Michael Eisner read the dedication plaque for Animal Kingdom on the first media day. The park would be Disney World's largest theme park. During his speech, he went on to honor the park's advisory board, a team of environmentalists, zoologists, and everyone who had worked so hard together to create the new park. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner, and I am proud to join all the animals and characters in welcoming you to Disney's Animal Kingdom and Walt Disney World. Tonight, you and your family will be among the first to visit and explore this amazing new theme park. The park opened the following day to the public on Earth Day, April 22nd, 1998. The day the park opened, it had roughly 2,500 cast members, 1,000 animals representing 200 species, and over 3,000 species of plants. Within 75 minutes, the park was at capacity. Eisner once again, just like he had with MGM Studios, gave visitors another reason not to leave Walt Disney World to see animals. Attendance on opening day and the next few months were far above expectations. Eisner said whatever doubts he may have had about the Animal Kingdom's viability were answered on the day the park opened. The park was expected to hurt the attendance of Busch Gardens Tampa. When asked before opening, Joseph Fincher, general manager of Busch Gardens at the time, said one good thing that happens with all Disney expansions is that tourism in Florida continues to grow. A very similar statement that Michael Eisner would answer when asked about Islands of Adventure at Universal. I think back in 91, somebody said to me in a meeting, we were talking about a variety of different kinds of concepts around the world. How about animals? And then somebody else said, oh, Disney's Animal Kingdom. And those three words had magic to them. And from then, nine years later, and a few dollars into it, uh, 
was ready to shoot the person who said Animal Kingdom. A few dollars, <laughs> about a billion dollars to build this park, right? Give or take a few hundred million. The park's entranceway was now African themed, with the Animal Kingdom sign above displaying the creatures you were supposed to find inside. That early concept of Noah's Ark was never used because there was no mythical creatures on board the ship. The new entranceway inside the park, called the Oasis, would capture the spirit of Animal Kingdom as you transitioned to see the Tree of Life. Inside you found seven highly themed areas. The Oasis, Safari Village, Camp Mini Mickey, Africa, Conservation Station, Asia, which opened later than the park, and Dinoland USA. While some of the early plans made for the park never made it, such as the Asian Safari, which was taken on rafts, or a dinosaur roller coaster through fossils, while featuring real life animals, it was also planned to be home of myths and legends. Cast costumes within the park were diverse and reflected the land they worked in. The park was so heavily themed that it looked like it had existed for years, even on opening day. Rather than retelling a classic story or the idea of movie making, Animal Kingdom was telling the story of nature. I was very skeptical that it was even physically possible to build the world of man. This was a crazy thing to try to do. The park has gone through many changes over the years. Joe Rohde continues to work on the park all these years later and after its opening, Roy E. Disney would spend much time in the park until he passed away in 2009. The decade-long creation of Animal Kingdom was long and very intense. Michael Eisner had now created two of the four parks at Walt Disney World. In closing, will you build a fifth park here, in, fifth theme park here in Orlando? Well, you can never say never. We're going to try to absorb this one and enjoy this one for a while. I would have an idea for down the road, which is kind of bubbling up in my mind. A sports-related theme park? Well, we have us? that. We have we have a sports complex. Okay. And we could add to that, yes. What, so is that the idea? Do no. You, no? What's the idea? No, I'm not sure yet. I mean, I am sure, but I haven't got, got my wife to tell me she likes it yet. The park is very different to what you will find anywhere else in the world. It was designed to connect people with animals, a place where story can be found at every corner and the more you look at the details, the more you will discover. Since its opening in 1998, it has captured the imagination of millions to become the fourth most visited theme park in the country and has continued to evolve to become better and better. <laughs> really not just 20 years of the existence of a park. It's 20 years of life. This park is filled with life. On this series of Expedition Animal Kingdom, we will explore the different lands within, the changes and the attractions in much more detail of this now 21 year old theme park, including the unbuilt ones. The park was considered impossible at one point. Years later, Walt's idea would become a reality. Animal Kingdom was built to be the home of animals, real and mythological, and one land that was never built ties this story together with that of another highly detailed and immersive theme park that opened just one year later down the road. And that is the story of Beastly Kingdom and the Lost Continent. That though, is for next time. Behold Atlantis! Greetings travellers, I am Merlin. Welcome to the Lost Continent. Thank you so much for watching the first episode of Expedition Animal Kingdom. We have a lot to cover in the future at this park, so let me know what you would like to see in the comments below. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes and a special thank you to our Patreons for supporting the channel. We will see you next time. Conservation isn't just the business of a few people. It's a matter that concerns all of us. But if we will use our riches wisely, if we will protect our wildlife, these things will last us for generations to come.